Good evening and welcome to our book launch bonanza brought to you by Riverwood Poetry uh, Series and Real Art Ways. My name is Pat Hale. I'm a member of the board of directors for Riverwood and I'm pleased and honored to welcome you to this special event. The last year has brought many changes to the way we interact and go about our daily lives. I don't need to tell you, tell any of you this, but while the pandemic has kept us from in-person gatherings and in-person poetry readings, it has not stopped our Connecticut poets from writing. Many new books of poetry have come out in this past year. Tonight, you'll hear six Connecticut poets read from their new books. And after the final poet has read, you'll have the opportunity for a Q&A session. But first, a few notes about Riverwood and Real Art Ways and tonight's event. Riverwood Poetry Series is an all volunteer nonprofit organization with the mission of bringing poetry to the greater Hartford area. Our board consists of Julia Paul, Joan Hoffman, Sherry Bedingfield, Debbie Gilbert, Kathleen McIntosh, and myself. For over a dozen years now, we've brought regionally and nationally known poets to our podium and have hosted readings, workshops, and festivals. We also offer open mics and have what we think is the best and most dynamic open mic in the area. For a couple of years now, we've partnered with Real Artways, an arts organization located on Arbor Street in Hartford. They've generously provided us a home base. Before the pandemic hit, we held our events in one of their art galleries. They continue to be our production partner now, providing publicity and technological and other support. Ian of Real Artways is with us tonight here in the director's chair and we thank Ian and all the folks at Real Art Ways for their support. Our events are held the second Tuesday of the month. Next month on Tuesday, February 9th, we're bringing you Karen Schofield, a Massachusetts poet who teaches writing to engineers at, um, where is she? University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and she's also a US Army veteran. That reading will be followed by an open mic for reasons of time, there will not be an open mic tonight. We want to give our audience a chance to respond to the new work being presented tonight. And so we'll have a Q&A session with our readers. You'll be able to type questions into the Q&A that's at the bottom of your screen. I encourage everyone to purchase the books you hear read from tonight. The flyer you received as part of our email blast contains links to where the books can be purchased. Or of course, you can just Google the book title or the author. On to our program. I'll be giving a two minute introduction for each poet. I could talk a lot longer about all of them, their accomplishments, their special strengths, their quirks, but I won't. I'll give the time over to our poets of the night. And our first one is Ben Grossberg. Ben Grossberg was named Connecticut's, Connecticut's, West Hartford's Poet Laureate in April of 2020. He's director of creative writing at the University of Hartford and says he loves teaching, that there is something wonderful about witnessing, letting the imagination loose and processing what it means to be human on the page. He's the winner of the 2008 Tampa Review Prize and the 2010 Lambda Literary Award. His work appears widely, including in the Pushcart Prize and Best American Poetry Anthologies, and in the magazines Plowshares, Boulevard, Kenyon Review, The Southern Review, Paris Review, and The Sun. Tonight, he'll be reading to us from his fourth book of poet poetry, entitled My Husband Would, which was published this year, or 2020, excuse me, um, by the University of Tampa Press. That book is described this way. Set at the crossroads of middle age, this book investigates love and family, both the families we're born into and those we create for ourselves. Kevin Prufer says about my husband Wood, in poem after poem, 
Grossberg creates that experience, intimate and enthralling, of laying bare a life, of guiding us through it with enormous wit, sadness, grace, and complexity. This is a brilliant book, one I will return to with joy and envy. Please join me in welcoming Ben Grossberg. Thank you to uh, Riverwood Real Artways, Pat um, and Joy. I'm delighted to, uh, to be part of this event and um, to be sharing a few poems from my new book with you. Tonight, I'm gonna read two poems. I'm gonna read a longer one and close with a short poem. Um, I chose these two poems for the contrast in form. I thought it might be fun. The first poem I'm gonna read is called My Mother's Novel. The premise of it is a little strange, so um, I'm gonna describe it briefly before reading the poem. So this poem is in sections. Some of the sections are in prose, others are lineated. And the poem um, imagines the novel my mother might have written had she written a novel. She was born in 1941. Um, I think she had a tremendous literary intelligence that never got the, um, the nurturing it might have needed to bloom. Um, she had very few choices in terms of work in her life, at least um, as she understood them. And this poem um, is about that and it imagines her autobiographical novel, had she written one. My mother's novel. The protagonist's shift is soaked in kerosene to remove a stain. And this results the next day at school in a peeling scald that she will remember for decades. Arriving home, she lifts the shift from her back and flakes fall around her that she slowly realizes are her skin. Then her own mother's arms folded, lips tight, and the single nod that stands in for pages of rationalization. This story may be apocryphal, but as my mother types it in the small pink sewing room off the kitchen, she lives it as if she's drawn a picture of a swimming pool, then reached a hand in through the cool surface up to her wrist. I am my mother's novel. I'm a placeholder for it. I am a substitute poor for it. I am it sublimated. I am its failure phoning on Fridays, its voice unintentionally mocking. I am an unprovable hypothesis and at a certain temperature melt into her words, Bob in the glass of them, an ice cube. She sits at the table, stirring a tumbler of vodka with her pinky. No, that's not her anymore. Rather, tiny feet up on the chair across from her, flow bare in one hand, half a dollar store cookie in the other. She bites carefully with one of her good teeth. Then she turns a page. I grow smaller. I'm to buy her Tolstoy. She insists a scholarly edition. She must have annotations. Mira, Mira, Mira. The protagonist, 16, walks down a side street. She is still, as she was as a child in Eretz Yisrael, overweight, but, and my mother lingers over the irony. She's very good at irony. She doesn't yet know that weight has redistributed to hips, breasts. Breasts, her school books, now flatten, tight in her arms. Mira, chica, chica, chica. To stop might be never to start again. And who on the street would notice her disappearance? It's 1957, Denton, Texas. And the defining element is dust. Cars or horses? Cars and dust. Each time a car passes, a cloud of it kicks up and swallows the three men on the corner, their crooked, darkened teeth, the brown leather of their arms, but their voices pierce through. 
Mira, Mira, Chica, Chica, Chica. Writing is a crack that widens itself. Let's unpack that, shall we? My mother's awareness has emerged, subterranean octopus through a cleft in the earth. First, two tentacles, wiry and flailing. They dig and scrape the crack wider, making space for the squishy head. Now it can come and go as it pleases at night, prowling the city for children and old people, squirreling them back into the earth to make of them plot development. I will not feel guilty. I will not make useless comparisons, but surely her books would have sold better than mine, which is to say at all. She does research. Could a single mother, a nurse, raise four children in Jersey in the mid eighties? How much would an apartment in Marlboro cost? Does Marlboro have apartments? No, it is not possible. She must kill one of the children. Is the protagonist's finger broken? He, he has yanked her wrist with his left hand, pulled off the ring with his right. Then the back of his arm, slamming the bathroom door and the tiny plunk of splashing water like a single piano key. Then a toilet flush. On the couch in half light, the toilet has been removed and up to his forearm, he's reaching through the wax ring, a black hole in the house he hadn't known, she hadn't known existed, an interface with another realm. There is, it turns out, a clear horizon from beyond which things cannot be recalled. If you need to use the bathroom, use the one upstairs, she announces. Three children peek out like prey animals from behind trees. A few minutes later, they eat hot dogs, squeezing the fluffy buns together as they bring them up to their mouths, their plates piled high with chips, eyes on the screen. The protagonist will make the harder choice and late at night, she will write. My mother puts my book on the table, face down, still open, making of it a lean-to. She looks at me, eyes over top of her glasses, which balance impossibly far down on the tip of her nose. She pauses, holding the moment's attention. Soon, a zinger. You haven't read Tolstoy? She stammers, shocked. Not even Steinbeck? My answer is the verbal equivalent of shuffling feet. The protagonist, older, a successful novelist, speaks at the commencement ceremony of a small private liberal arts college, one of those peppy anachronisms. She discusses two roads that were, she insists, her fist hard against the podium, the same road to minister to the very old or the very young, the Chinese menu of my mother's life, mother spinster, teacher nurse. A folding chair in the first row purposefully left empty represents the possibility of me, just in case the unbirthed spirit visits, like the cup left out for Elijah. She insists on this at all speaking events. Two roads that were the same road, and she, by temperament, no better suited to either than I would be. So she writes, I write her writing, late at night now, a single light on in the sewing room off the kitchen. She's on to something good. Um, and I'm just going to read one, uh, one other poem, um, a short one. Um, uh, and I thought maybe the contrast would be fun. This poem is called The Hummingbird. Um, my, my book, I'm going to uh, show you all the cover again, um, is about marriage. Um, 
and one of the things it's about is how I learned about marriage um, and marriage in our society. So there are poems about my parents' marriage. My mother's novel is sort of one of those. And there are also poems about um, uh, my, my own experiences and thoughts regarding um, marriage or dating. And this poem falls under the latter category, the hummingbird. This in middle age, when all I've seen has taken on a tired resemblance, birds in their morning scattering and men in theirs, songs for sleeping through. The chance meeting, a splash of color that might open the heart. Well, it's self-inflicted violence to hope too long and no shame to settle in to what's at hand, an empty bed and sense. Then this, this morning, the zinnias blurred to desert sunset and above them, almost still in sharp relief, the ink drop eye, the throat rouged blue. I'd never seen a hummingbird, not this close. I could have brushed its needle bill with my fingertips or palmed its buzzing heat. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And add that to the list of books that I have to buy. <laughs> um, again, I encourage listeners to enter any comments or questions into the Q&A for uh, at the end of the reading and also to buy the book. Um, thank you, Ben. Our next poet is Deborah Sansone. Deborah is a writer, artist, teacher, and healer. Her two previous books of poetry are entitled Shared Air and Other Poems and for sky, day is night. Uh, Deborah will be reading tonight from her newest book, Third Eye on the Prize, published by Finishing Line Press. Third Eye on the Prize deals with creativity, consciousness, and mindfulness. Her book takes the reader on a deep dive into startling revelations of form and essence offered up by both the natural and human-made worlds. Her newest book continues her long time exploration into the power of consciousness and mindfulness, contrasted with the absurdity of our sometimes mindless foibles. Deborah's poems are often rooted in her observations of the natural world. They find the connection between the natural world and the intangible, demonstrating how every form tells us something about formlessness. Deborah is an alumna of Parsons School of Design and Harvard University, and has won national awards for her work in corporate training, multimedia production, and instructional design. Interesting fact, her first book of poetry was created at the age of 14 and contained original photographs and artwork. That book is not offered for sale tonight, but her latest book, Third Eye on the Prize is. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Sansone. Hello, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, let's be honest, it's not easy listening to poetry, uh, let alone dealing with the Zooming. This is my first Zoom reading, um, but this venue is enabling many of you who are listening right now, tuning in um, and, and um, that would not be here otherwise. So for that, I am really grateful and, um, and appreciative. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, actually share the poems on the screen as I read them. So just bear with me with that. I do want to thank Riverwood Poetry for including me in this, in this event. And thank you to Real Art Ways for making it happen. Billy Collins says every poem has a starting subject and then a second discovered subject. A lot of my poems 
um, reveal my fascination with the vast intelligence that's beneath or behind the surface appearance of things. <clears throat> the first poem is um, about how our eye is like a camera shutter in that it responds to light or the absence of light. Um, but it's also about how it's so much more than that. It's called Iris. The pupil is a cipher, doorway to vision, exquisitely attuned sentinel of photons and desire. My daughter's cat taught me this, sitting contentedly by the window, turning his gaze upward toward the overcast sky, still bright enough to shrink his pupils from circle to almond sliver. They plumped out again when he turned his head back toward the inane shadows of man-made shelter and boredom until a bird flurried by, a flash of feathers whipping Whiskey's head around to follow the whooshing whir of wings, like lightning his attention now ignited by intention. And though the light had not changed, Iris and Pupil were suddenly servants of desire, agreeing to open fully to the promise of pursuit. The next poem is about, let me actually just go back to it here. Um, the intricate layers that surround your brain, um, every one of us, and protect it, and how appropriate that they are named after the person who protects life. So this is called Three Mothers in Your Head. A triumvirate of membranes envelop your nervous system's core, meninges, surrounding brain and spinal cord, each one a meanings, sounds like meanings. Outermost is dura mater, hard mother, badass protector of the priceless. I will not tolerate your laying waste to your talents, don't even think about it. Arachnoid mater is the mother in the middle. A delicate spider web of filaments, she balances, juggles, negotiates an endless stream of signals and demands. It's for your own good, you know. And the deepest one, Pia Mater, tender mother. Innermost, highly vascular, never take a break, cushion of cerebrospinal fluid, inseparable from that which she protects. The members of this triple guard tenuously tethered together, mothering, too important and difficult a job for anyone to do alone. <clears throat> this is actually a new poem that is not, has not been published yet. Um, so this, this one is about, um, maybe I should stop, hold on. <laughs> um, the next poem is about, uh, the way butterflies very slowly open and close their wings, which I didn't know is called basking, um, but also about the delicate uh, balance, the delicate balance of nature um, that we really need to protect. Basking butterflies. Nature is too weird and wondrous to fully wrap our minds around. Butterflies have light receptors in their genitalia. Light too crucial to misread, heat too momentous to mess with. Monarchs see ultraviolet polarized light and use it to navigate. Some males have hearts in their wings, regulating temperature, sensing sunlight's intensity and direction. Spreading one's wings is risky, revealing beauty is risky, lays one open to being devoured. Basking in brilliance, a slow-mo dance, choreography of quiet and contraction, wing whispering transfiguration, skinny sideways slipping into dazzling display, surreptitious silent spectacle, shrewdly, gingerly inviting incandescence, wanting warmth, but not too much just enough effulgence, commensurate conduction, ideal illumination, sipping, not swigging, sweet radiance, just enough, not too much. Um, 
I really believe that animals have a lot to teach us. Um, many of my poems touch on that. Uh, this next poem also has a term in it that I uh, just want to point out. It's, it's abhaya. It's a Sanskrit word and it means fearlessness. The ferocious joy of bird song. One of the most dauntless forces imaginable, a mother bears ferocity when her cubs are threatened. Let me call up that strength so that my heart can open without fear. Abhaya, right hand held up, extended outward in the same gesture we use when swearing to tell the truth. On an exquisite fall day, warm with soft light, remnant of summer breeze momentarily abated. My birds serenade me in a chorus from the backyard trees. They sing in counterpoint to traces of wind that rustle the leaves in rising swells and receding airwaves. Enthusiastically jazzed, they sound like an excited throng of shoppers on sale day or a crowd awaiting the imminent arrival of an adored celebrity. They step on each other's lines with abandon carry each other along in a wave of chirping. There's no end or beginning to their song. Behind them, a distant drone of highway traffic annoys me, but they continue as if unaware of disturbances in their field. Riding the cadences with mother bear's ferocity. Abhaya's in there somewhere. We'll go on singing. We're not intimidated. We're not threatened. We don't even know what that means. Um, sorry about that. My mechanics are the smoothest here. This is my first Zoom reading. Um, the next poem is about um, what it's like when someone receives something that you have to share that is difficult to do. It's called Friend. You sat and waited, and in that pregnant pause, a space of expectancy was formed, an energetic nest assembled from twigs and reeds of your attention, lovingly gathered, painstakingly held together with a soft clay of patient listening. And you waited as I struggled through a series of confessional contractions, no sound yet emerging, only desire permeated the air. It's time, I thought. Here it comes. And as in the hours before birth, a low level of dread hovered around the edges of a sacred hopefulness, and you knew exactly how to fashion a perfectly safe place for my egg to land. Um, I just wanted to take a second to um, share that I do have a website. Um, it is just the name of the book, thirdeyeontheprize.com. Um, I would love it if you would visit. There are quite a few poems on, on the website and as well as some uh, videos. So um, there it is. And the last two poems I'm gonna read are actually from my first book, Shared Air. And the first one is Birth. Did you really think it would be easy passing from one realm to another? Then again, I don't remember the trek through the canal, but I'm pretty sure it was no Venetian gondola ride. We guileless, gillless fish float for a while in primordial soup, kept warm in a takeout container called mommy. Until that moment, determined by one infinitely amused at the, pres the presumption of a due date. Propelled by peristalsis through God's elementary canal, thrust into a heady mix of nitrogen and oxygen. If only we knew not to be afraid, we'd ride the wave of breath like cosmic surfers, emerging from submersion to the light that parts the waves after a wipeout, rising to the shimmer that dances on the surface where water meets air. And I'm gonna close with an embarrassment of riches. 
A message of truth can come at any moment from any being. The transmitter of the message may be unassuming, wearing the guise of an innocent, a madman, perhaps your own worst enemy. The sage we seek in flowing robes may inhabit the body of a bug, a tree, water, wind, sand, sun. So be careful whom or what you scorn or quash or even follow with undying devotion while your nameless guru scuttles away on six legs or dissolves with the evaporating dew. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Deborah. That was beautiful. Thank you. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Um, I loved seeing them at the same time as hearing them. Yeah. And again, a reminder, enter your Q and A's in the Q and A. Our next reader is John Stanizzi. In order to not cut into his reading time, I won't provide the details of all the national journals John Stinizzi's poetry and creative nonfiction have appeared in. Suffice it to say that John is widely and well published. He's the author of Ecstasy Among Ghosts, Sleepwalking, Dance Against the Wall, After the Bell, Hallelujah Time, High Tide, Ebb Tide, Four Bits, Chance, Sundowning, and the latest book, Pond. He's been translated into Italian and appeared in many Italian journals. He led a workshop for Riverwood a couple of years ago that was so well attended, we had to bring in extra chairs. <laughs> He's a former <laughs> New England, and it was really hard. He was a former New England Poet of the Year, Wesleyan University Etherington Scholar. Um, he teaches literature at Manchester Community College and lives with his wife, Carol, in Coventry. The title of the new book is Pond. It contains photographs and four line poems, the products of daily visits to a nearby pond. Um, I'll let him explain that further. It's very cool. I'd like to quote what David Leth said about pond. He says, with a poet's voice and a naturalist's eye, John Stinnesy takes us on a daily journey in verse and photographs to a pond near his home where he reveals the secrets of nature hidden in plain view. These artfully crafted four line acrostics using the letters P, O, and D cycle through the seasons, painting a bold picture of nature's ever-changing events. Stinizzi's keen observations and metaphorical connections not only delight in the reading, they forever enlarge and give meaning to our experiences. Please join me in welcoming John Stinizzi. Thank you so much, Pat um, and Julia, uh, for having me. Uh, and, and of course, to Real Artways as well. Um, this, this is what it looks like. It's, uh, it's called Pond. And what I, what I did was I decided that we've lived here for 30 years and we've enjoyed the pond, but I never actually looked at it. And so I came up with the idea that I would visit the pond uh, every single day for one year. And I would um, write, I would come back and write a four line acrostic using P-O-N and D. And if a photo op uh, appeared, I would take a photograph. Um, and then I added uh, another caveat, don't ask me what I, <laughs> what I was thinking. But the, but the other thing that I added was that I could never use a P-O-N or D word more than once. So, so once I used it, it was out of the running uh, to ever appear in the book again. So, um, so I'll, ju I'll just read a few uh, of, of these. They're, they're, they're four lines, they're very short. Um, and we'll, uh, I'll begin on uh, January 8th of 2019. Um, 1.13 in the afternoon, it was 38 degrees. Proclamation of the wind, freeze the pond, and the obscurant vapors will float metaphors into the air. Null the stillness there, which is not so much metaphor as a dream-worthy fantasy, a reverie about 
tranquility and joy. Um, we're still in January. Uh, uh, I was missing green so much that I came across some string algae that was green and I was giddy because I saw, I saw green in January. Um, this is uh, January 15th, uh, 7.49 a.m., 14 degrees. Pallid algae embedded in ice like a flea trapped in amber offers a day glow dab to the rusted out brown landscape. Neon string algae luminous beside the hoarfrost and the dented surface of the pond, the moon rolled out and hammered. This is, um, we gotta get to some warmer ones. <laughs> this is January 22nd, um, 2.11 in the afternoon, 22 degrees. Polished snowpack, solid and sheer. I walk on top of the snow. Opulated with ice, the runoff pipe is bursting and the birches notched and haggard are leaning out over the ice, having discarded their jewels, which scatter along the pond's surface. Okay. Um. Oh, April, <laughs> it's getting warmer. Yay, Yay. April 15th. 11 o'clock, 11.01, 59 degrees, much better than whatever it was, 14, 14 or so, yeah, 14. Pretending they are raindrops, groups of skippers scatter, overreaching concentric circles, ripples like rain on the water, naval orbits widening to nothing, in the pond that is full, I dare say, as Frost said, above the brim after torrential rain. I'll get it. There it is. Um, we're still in April. This is uh, the 21st, right around noon, 60 degrees. Pleasures of greens, fields, new leaves, pastures of skunk cabbage, occurrences of repeated splashes and ripples just after the frogs have leapt. Nicknames for plants, bittersweet, virgin's bower, pussy toes, harebell, and diving wobblers, the pollywogs are back today, flashing and flaring at the shoreline. I think I have two more here. Yeah, we're into May. Uh, May 5th, 2019, 10.57 a.m., 53 degrees. Purest concerto of toads and peepers around the pond, the woods on the outskirts, everywhere until I approach and they preserve their silence in the nooks in which they hide in the open invisible right in front of us, like dollops of gray clay, given besides their malleability, the gift of song. And I'll, I'll do one more and we'll call it quits. Um, we're into June. This is June 18th, um, 
6.49 a.m., 64 degrees. Parsimonious sun gives up mostly clouds this morning, keeping the sunshine outcast, hidden behind a profuse cloud cover and a scrim of mist. Nighthawk, a solitary, sweeps in loops with a gulp of swallows who, when they get dusty, bathe in the sand in the path before returning to their industry of flight. So thank you very much, thanks. I'm so happy to say I never missed one single day in a whole year. That's, <laughs> um. that, 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 yeah, so, so thanks, thank, thanks so much, I appreciate it. Um, thank you, John. I, I look forward to seeing 365 different words that begin with the letter D. <laughs> <laughs> They're there. <laughs> um, again, uh, enter your questions uh, into the Q&A and buy the book. Our next reader is Julia Paul. Julia Paul is president of Riverwood Poetry Series and served as Manchester's first poet laureate. Her poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in a variety of literary journals, both national and international, as well as in several anthologies, including Under the Bridges of America and Forgotten Women. Uh, her poetry collection Shook was published by Grayson Books in 2018. Tonight, she'll be reading to us from her chapbook, Staring Down the Tracks which was recently published by The Poetry Box. Two poems from that book have been uh, nominated for Pushcart Prizes. Staring Down the Tracks is a collection of poems that gives voice to those affected by addiction, a population that despite their numbers and diverse demographics is often harshly judged and silenced by shame. The mother of, and son of these poems are your neighbors, friends, relatives, and co-workers who need to have a dialogue with you. Poet Daniel Dunaghy says, staring down the tracks takes you inside addictions, silences to reveal in honed works of lyricism, a mother's relentless worry and pain and grief as her son who loved his skateboard, now finds no vein for happy. Paul has pulled these words somehow from the far reaches of the unsayable. This book will help families engulfed in addiction know that they are not alone and give others insight into its horror. It is a courageous and generous collection an essential contribution to literature about addiction that will change you. Please join me in welcoming <clears throat> Julia Paul. Hi everyone, it's so good to be here. I wanna say a quick thank you to all of you for honoring our panel of poets with your presence and your attention. As Pat mentioned, I'm reading from my chapbook, which is a collection of 25 poems. The poems deal with my son's, my oldest son's struggles with substance use disorder. He fought opioid addiction for many years and sadly lost his battle in January of 2020 when he died from a drug overdose. Brendan wanted me to write these poems. He wanted me to share them. He wanted me to speak out about the horrors of addiction, both for the addicted and the families that love them. The book was with the publisher when Brendan died. So it is dedicated to him as is my reading tonight. I'm going to start with a poem called, He Said. He 
he said he was just tired. He said he knew nothing about missing change. He said, what's wrong with long sleeves? He said he needed money for food, gas, rent. He said he needed to be bailed out. He said the needles belonged to Randy's brother. He, he said he had to pay them back or they'd kill him. He said, you don't understand what it's like. He said rehab. He said no rehab beds. He said, I have sepsis. I have hep C. He said, I have a bed. He said, they don't know what they're doing. I'm out of here. He said, bullshit, fuck you. I hate you. He said, I have a detox bed. He said, I just need a ride, no money. He said, I need money. He said, I love you. He said, you don't understand. I'm outside, it's pouring, it's snowing. I'm freezing, I'll die, I have sun poisoning. Someone stole my phone, my ID is missing, my face is abscessed, I'm hungry, I love you. I may have a job tomorrow, I need money today. You don't understand, I miss the family, I can't stop, I need help, there are no beds. There's a bed, I'll be honest, I used again, I have kidney failure. You don't understand. I just need 40. Can you make it 60? Fuck you. I haven't eaten. Someone took my coat, my prescriptions, my cell phone. I have court tomorrow. I love you. I need a ride. I'm on the bus. I'm at the hospital, in jail, under the bridge. I'll meet you at Save-A-Lot. I was kidnapped. I owe them 300 your rings in the pawn shop, your leaf blower, lawnmower, laptops in the pawn shop. I pawned my car. Tell everyone I love them, miss them. I hate everyone. Can you bring me food? It's 4th of July, my birthday, Thanksgiving, Christmas. They have a gun to my head. Can you give me 20, 40, 80, 200? I'm going in tomorrow, I promise. This is it, I'll never ask again. Can you bring me dry clothes? It rained last night, 40, 60, 100. I won't ask again. There's no bed, I need a bed. 60, 80, all you've got. I won't ask again. He said, this is it. He said, I'm falling fast. He said, I'm falling hard. The next poem is the one that the publisher of the chapbook nominated in 2020 for a Pushcart Prize. It's called Black Dot. This is what loneliness looks like, defined by what surrounds it, a single black balloon slipping through white sky. This is the period at the end, sitting stone still at the end of a sentence, any sentence, including this one. This is what God looks like from behind closed eyes, faceless and distant. This is the soul, according to some, the soul blackened by sin, the light of grace snuffed out. No, this is the needle mark. This is the black hole into which the self disappears. This is the exit wound. The next poem, I don't know if any of you remember, um, there was a TV show called Fractured Fairy Tales where they took a fairy tale and blew it up. So. That's more or less what I did in this poem to communicate the um, chaos of addiction. It's called Broken Boy 
the fractured tail. All the king's horses and all the king's men are confused when the boy jumps over the candlestick and his pants catch fire. Liar, liar, pants on fire, your nose is longer than a telephone wire. It's not supposed to happen this way, so they eat curds and whey and split the scene. The boy comes tumbling after, but no matter, he's wearing a crown and an irresistible grin. Well, that boy's eating Christmas pie in the hood, puts in his thumb and pulls out a bundle, a penny for a ball of thread, another for a needle. That's the way the money goes. How much more can he wheedle? Then, once upon a time in the land of Nod, the dish runs away with the spoon. Soon, the breadcrumb path through the forest leads to a house covered in candy. He eats everything until his belly aches. He begs for a bowl of porridge or some tums for his tummy and a couch to crash on. He calls the old lady who lives in a shoe. She'll know what to do. If she doesn't answer, he'll huff and he'll puff. Three, four, knock at the door. Round and round and round he goes. How he'll land, no one knows. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. The last poem that I will share with you tonight uh, was published in a journal called Here, which is out of Eastern Connecticut State University and was nominated by them for a 2020 Pushcart Prize. And where did it go? It's called One Summer Day. Before the needle shuddered in his arm, before the bent spoon bent back the strap, before complaining veins, before a procession of scabs jeweled his flesh, before his half-lidded chase for what couldn't be caught, before the trampled path into the woods behind Save-A-Lot, before unforgiving rain, endless snow, blistering heat, before donated blankets and gloves, shoplifted sunblock, before waiting for someone to toss their cigarette as they entered a store so he could snatch it, bring it to his lips and dry hump it back to life. Before long sleeves in summer and pawn tickets dashed under football trophies, before the oxy parties, before the root canal, the script, the refills, before ashes, ashes, we all fall down. There was a boy who loved his skateboard, how it took him where he wanted to go, toward all that might have been. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for sharing that powerful journey with us. Um, Please, as I've said after every poet, uh, please enter any questions you have into the Q&A and buy the books, buy the books. Our next poet is Nancy Kerrigan. Um, Nancy's an alumnus of Wesleyan Writers Week and workshops at the Frost Place in New Hampshire. Her poetry appears in many journals and anthologies and she's published three chapbooks of poetry entitled The Voices, The Poetry of Psychiatry, High Heels and Sneakers, My Balance Myth, and A Place for What Was. Nancy is a psychiatric nurse. She's worked as a psychotherapist in hospitals and private practice and has taught psychiatric nursing at uh, several hospitals, I mean, universities, including Yale. 
She brings to her poetry a unique understanding of and interest in the human mind. She says that poetry is the artistic medium of choice for describing the complexities and ambivalences of the human mind. She'll be reading to us tonight from her new book, which is called Lucky Enough, A Journey, published by Grayson Books. Now, if you know Nancy as well as I know Nancy, you know that she loves Chicago, she loves Ireland, she loves poetry, and she's fascinated by the human mind. The poems in Lucky Enough trace a life shaped by an Irish Catholic youth in Chicago on through the trials and joys of her particular adulthood. She takes us from Chicago to Hartford to Ireland and back to the mind's eye and the heart of the home through a life lived and other lives imagined. It's a journey through time, geography, and the labyrinths of the heart. You don't have to be Irish American to relate to the emotions and evocations in this poetry collection. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Kerrigan. Cade Meadle of Falston, that is a hundred thousand welcomes in Irish. I hope um, my uh, uh, titles will uh, bear the weight of the poems so I don't have to explain them. Pat did a wonderful job of introducing me. You know, an Irish Catholic that's come to uh, um, Protestant New England and had a visit, several visits to Ireland. The first poem is about my father. It is, and I'm going to read one about my mother, uh, one about uh, Ireland and coming here to Connecticut. First one is called Streetwalkers. Nuns travel in pairs, two instead of one, a covalent bond with positive and negative powers ever present at the right or wrong time, depending on your perspective. Some swaddled in layers of heavy white muslin, heads crowned with a long black heart-shaped veil. Did they have hair or are they bald under there? Dad often offered uh, to give a lift to the spiritual streetwalkers who made us memorize the Baltimore Catechism, a black and white text with answers for the unknowable. I snitched on them to dad. Sister said, God calls you, taps you on the shoulder. At 12, I didn't want to be called by anyone not in my grade or I didn't want to be a habit, even a good habit. Jesus, dad grumbled. In one sentence, he saved me. Promptly, he replied, God knows, Nancy, you can't wear the same thing every day. That's my dad. I grew up in Chicago, and this is lucky enough, Chicago in the 1960s. If you're lucky enough to be Irish in America, storytelling is in your bones. You build tales about what you remember and what you don't. Storytelling, not a side dish, not a, rather an entree at any celebration. If you're lucky enough to be Irish, you could sell an Eskimo or refrigerator, but never teach an Italian how to cook. Without those paisans, you and yours would endure another great famine. If you're lucky enough to be Irish, subverting the oppressor is an intricate marker woven into your DNA. One Irish Catholic so adept, he charms the Chicago mayor and a few Protestants to advance his campaign. If you're lucky enough to be Irish, you commiserate with Jewish girls, not easy to find in the neighborhood. 
you learn Jews atone only once a year. And Catholics go weekly to confess, confess, confess. If you're lucky enough to be Irish, you dream about dashing Latin lovers. A book entitled Irish Erotic Art, you know is full of blank pages. If you're even luckier to be Irish and female, you become linked to women all over the world who like the Blessed Mother think their sons are God. If you're lucky enough to be Irish, you're lucky enough. Now this next poem is my poem about change. I presented this at um, the, oh, I forget where it was, but anyway, they accepted it for their books. The Purple Metallic Convertible is the title of the poem. The purple metallic convertible was the last loner on the lot on a top-down day in May with the family sedan safely in the dealer's hands. I peeled away. Convertibles automatically subtract 10 years off your driver's license. Midlife mother became Lolita in uh, in sunglasses with blonde hair flying in a car I'd never pick. Drivers honked as my briefcase bounced to the Beach Boys. Fun, fun, fun till her daddy takes her T-bird away. Sometimes a day just takes you. Sometimes a day just takes you like a $100 bill in the envelope day or a sudden call from a lost, long lost lover day and takes you to a secret room in yourself where you burst right through that closed door in a purple metallic convertible with the Beach Boys blaring and you do something you have never done before like blow off a work day or spend all the money on yourself or go out with the married man. And even if it rained all day on the beach or the money only purchased useless lottery tickets or the long lost lover was nothing more than an oil slick, that night with your hair hung over the headrest while you're gazing at the moonlit night, you feel satisfied that you sampled the cookies when they were passed that you searched around in that room you never explored. Sometimes we just need to shift into another gear. Shifting into another gear landed, lands me in um, Connecticut. And this poem I call Eastern Adulterer. It's been years since we've lived together, Chicago. You, the second city, my first love, my regular guy, neck of your rented tuxedo shirt unbuttoned, tie loosened, in gilded ballrooms like old movie sets, we dance till dawn, spread down Lakeshore Drive to see the park to see the sunrise home of the Cubs, the Sox, the Bulls, and the Bears, where winners and losers, saints and sinners, are love just the same. The Sandbergs, Carl and Ryan, the Richard Dalys, even Al Capone. City of riots, schemes, and scandals, where a passerby will look you straight in the eye. Your skyline never recedes, becomes more beautiful with age. Skyscrapers that loomed out of the lake, my big brothers, ready to protect me. City of big shoulders, near which I laid my head each night, I left your weathered, unshaven face, fearful that the passion had drained from our 40-year marriage. 
Soon Hartford's Brooks Brothers bureaucrats were breaking, breathing down my neck. Suitable men turned into etnoids by the world of insurance. Actuarial tables more important than musical scales. But any city with writers' houses in a row seemed a luxury for any literary highbrow. Um, wait, I gotta get there. Your sunken garden wooed me with words that gently kissed my cheeks. Captivated by your New England charm, awed by your brainy schools and good looks, I've become an Eastern adulterer, sleeping here for a while, savoring each fall, never waking in a bed that feels like home, like my own, arising each morning with a question, how can a nine to five town ever be home? Uh, this is the poem about my mother and uh, um, yeah, uh, and I'll end with this one. It's called Bocelli and You. Ascend step by step to the upper deck at the opera house. Audience lined up like unread books. Uh, you would have devoured every one of them. Heights, I hate them, save for the high notes that awaken. Down Bocelli's voice cascades. My tears drop like whole notes falling off the music's black line page. Eyes closed. I see you with youthful brown hair. Your tears, a stream on your face, scrubbing on hands and knees. The Metropolitan Opera, bewildering and beckoning on the kitchen radio. Applause interrupts my reverie. My mind resurrects you, mother, conducting the routine symphony of daily life. Without you, my focal point is gone. No one loves sad arias like you. Lost a theme recurring in any great love. Your voice your taste, music is in me. Sometimes we even hummed in tune. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for sharing your journeys with us. Thanks. And again, buy the books. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, our final poet of the evening is Rennie McQuilkin. Rennie has acted as poetry's ambassador here in Connecticut for as long as I've been aware of poetry. He's encouraged many poets and helped very many on to the road to publication and also shown a lot of people who don't think they're poets that they are actually poets and people who don't think they like poetry that they can like poetry. Rennie McQuilkin served as Connecticut Poet Laureate from 2015 to 2018. He co-founded the Sunken Garden Poetry Festival and directed it for nine years. His poetry has appeared in The Atlantic, Poetry, The American Scholar, The Southern Review, The Yale Review, The Hudson Review, and many other publications. He's the author of several poetry collections, I think like 17, 18, <laughs> and has received a number of prestigious awards, including fellowships from the NEA and the Connecticut Commission on the Arts. He got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Connecticut Center for the Book and its 2010 Poetry Award. Uh, Eamon Grennan, called The Readiness, which is a book that Rennie published in 2019, A Wonder. Um, he says he celebrates the radiant ongoingness of the natural and human worlds that he has taken, it seems, into his care. 
Dick Allen says of Rennie's poetry, he has a voice unlike that of any other contemporary poet. So natural, so sympathetic, so convincing that the many moments and passages of fulfilled perceptions occur in these poems like the effortless unfolding of wings. Tonight, Rennie will be reading to us from his latest book entitled Coming Through. Please join me in welcoming Rennie McQuilkin. There, I'm unmuted. Okay, <laughs> I've been mute for so long. Oh, it's been wonderful listening to so many different voices. And uh, there's so many thanks all around to, to Pat and Julia, and, and but all those wonderful voices that I've just been hearing uh, and real art ways, of course. And But there's that audience out there that we can't see. Thank, thank you for being out there. We, we hope you're there. Um, I've, uh, like, uh, like, my, like, uh, brother John, uh, Stanisi, brother John, uh, I've also been trying to write a, a poem a day, uh, for better or worse, mostly worse, I'm sure. Uh, and, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this book is, uh, the most recent, uh, uh, incarnation. That's skunk cabbage, in case you don't know what that russet looking thing coming up through the ice. Uh, coming through uh, and coming coming through as uh, uh, kind of the theme of the book in a in a variety of ways. Um, I'm gonna I'm going to uh, start with a poem uh, for uh, Charlie Ferguson, who was for many years the uh, director of the New Britain Museum of American Art and then a resident here, and one of my great friends and a great human being uh, who passed away not too long ago. Uh, and uh, the poem is it's on uh, page 10 in the, in this book uh, is entitled uh, migration however if you're looking at the poem you'll see I've made a lot of changes so maybe you better not look <laughs> so migration for Charlie Ferguson Charlie is gone though his courtyard is full of late blossoming so much of which he plotted scant consolation, like knowing the ruby-throated nectar seekers also gone are south of here at speeds I can't follow, like Charlie's. Now where he lived, this shock of seeing a larger than I remember pair of wings, red, orange, yellow, and white spotted, with umber dividers like leading in stained glass, opening and shutting in the jubilation of the juice of a purple butterfly bush. So entirely here, it's hard to imagine it will winter in Mexico. As a boy, I chased such monarchs for miles and mounted them on cotton batting. I mean, to hold on less tightly now. Leave space in the netting for beauty to go its own way. Ooh, nice. So I have to read what I'm doing here. This poem is entitled Dessert Table and it's on page 20 in the book. Dessert table. My oncologist says I am at stage four and assures me that my current treatment will work for only so long. The cancer has an agenda and will have its way. What my oncologist doesn't know is that my current stage is the dessert table in the first Congregational Church's Saturday Food Pantry. I'm the guy heading, handing out the good stuff, 
the cake and pie, Danish and brownies, all that comes after the chow down. The world has gone all to hell, but where I am is the joy that passeth understanding of cancer, bill collections, utilities turned off, and for many here, defending a safe doorway out of the wind. Our eyes meet close over the sweets I hand out. <laughs> and now I have for this child a favor that comes with party cake from a local bakery, a glittering space traveler's ring to take her anywhere she wants to go. She puts it on and smiles so hugely it takes me anywhere but where the oncologist thinks I am. <laughs> the next poem is uh, uh, based on a video many of you may have seen of a, uh, uh, a moose and her calf. Uh, the uh, moose was trying to get the calf across a crowded road and was having trouble getting uh, the calf across the road. Um, I, I, I suspect many of you have seen it. Uh, and uh, this is a, a riff on that, uh, which ends with something that was not in the, uh, in the video, uh, but it ought, ought to have been. Uh, it's uh, entitled The Crossing. Oh, my breath stopped as caravans of cars to the north and south stopped. Headlights on in the gray gloaming while a moose gangled back and forth like a crossing guard. Head up as if to say to the cars, stay back, let him cross. The small calf wobbling on the far side of the road, advanced and fell back, unsure its mother's repeated crossings promised safe passage. Finally, the moose, shaking her head, moved toward the nearest car as if to charge it, then returned to the calf and once more cleared the way like a tackle blocking for the runner which the calf now became racing across the divide and into underbrush on the other side. The cars, blinking lights, sounded like New Year's Eve. That's the part that wasn't in the video, but I'll bet they did. <laughs> I think that's a tell all the truth, but tell it slant. And part of the slant is, uh, you know, using your imagination to create what isn't necessarily literally there. Oh, well, there are all kinds of ways in which you can tell the truth slant. But, uh, and, um, and my last poem uh, is uh, called The Dancing. Uh, at uh, Seabury, we, uh, we have wonderful events. We're hoping next, Nancy Kerrigan will be here for one of them oh. to celebrate. To celebrate. Mm -hmm. St. Patrick's Day, 2022, I'm afraid it'll have to be. Okay. Uh, but uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, and um, one of the, uh, the events uh, we had here recently was uh, an Alzheimer's panel uh, in uh, which uh, one of my friends turned out to be one of the panelists, Bob Savage. Uh, many of you may know Bob. He was a habitue at the Sunken Garden Festival. And, and gave generously to the festival and is a, a great man and uh, uh, is uh, managing his Alzheimer's by uh, becoming an artist. And uh, he recently had a show in, in Atlanta. He's, he's a great guy. Uh, and I, I was delighted when it turned out he was part of this audience. Uh, so the, uh, the poem is entitled, The Dancing. We mean to enjoy our new lives is the motif of these panelists diagnosed with Alzheimer's. 
One speaks of black holes in his brain scan, but there's laughter and joy in all they say. In the Q and A, one of the panelists, my friend, stumbles down the auditorium aisle, calling my name loudly enough for all to hear. He throws his arms around me, kisses me, says, my id is on the loose. He swings me as his dancing partner, says I am one thing he hasn't forgotten, holds me at arm's length, recalls a poem I sent him about my father growing gentle and loving in his dementia. Then back to our dance, uncivilized dance of two bears, civil as never before, he with gaps in his brain, I with feet and legs gone numb, chest excavated to dig out its cancer. We are a pair all right, I say, and he laughs, his larger than life laugh. On we go, dancing and dancing. Uh, that, uh, Oh, that was supposed to be the last poem. <laughs> uh, it would be a good one to be the last, but I, I did have one more, and I, uh, oh, it's, sure. it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to read one more if that's okay. I uh, just realized I forgot it. Uh, it's uh, entitled Endurance, um, and um, it's a poem that wrenches my heart, uh, as uh, as Julius wrenched our hearts and her heart. Um, Endurance, uh, as m many of you know, is a book by Ernest Shackleton uh, and recounts a uh, heroic episode in the Antarctic when he was able to save every last one of his men despite impossible odds, despite the ice closing in. It was my mother's uh, favorite book. And mm. uh, we, uh, she, she uh, read it uh, over and over again, actually. Uh, she had memorized it, uh, and one night was reading it uh, at at her uh, home on the hill where I was visiting her, and um, uh, when uh, something a signal came through to me that I had to go uh, to my father, uh, and I don't know where that signal came from. He was in a he, he was dying of Alzheimer's. Uh, and uh, in any case, uh, it's, it's mysterious how these things come through to us. But the poem is called Endurance. Beside me, mother was deep in endurance. Shackleton and his men stranded on ice flows. When I began to feel an animal insistence, though it was late at night, to go to my stranded father who'd lost his and our names. At his bedside, I held his cold hand and waited for his breath. It seemed forever between them, but slowly they continued, more slowly as time went on. Then I waited too long too long before I heard another, deeper, different, and after that a silent space, too empty, too vast. The light was still on when I returned to mother. Her head was lowered, her book on the floor foundered. She seemed to know said nothing, shuddered like Shackleton's ship going under. Next day, she read to me from Endurance how after the boat went down, the crew managed, salvaged lifeboats, pushed past the ice, reached Elephant Island, came through. And by God, my mother was a survivor who came through, and she was a wonderful poet too. 
Um, and uh, so uh, thank you all um, here and there out in the audience and all of you poets. Uh, we have such a great community of poetry in, uh, in this region. And uh, this is a large part of it. Thank you, Rennie. That was wonderful. Oh, I just want to sit and bask for a moment. But, um, I want to encourage everyone. Uh, I can't say it again. Uh, thanks to all six poets for sharing your work with us tonight. And thank you to the audience as well. Um, the people we can't see, but we know are there. And we can now move on to the Q&A session and see if I can see them. There we are. Benjamin Grossberg. Um, a lot of people liked seeing the poems while they were read. <laughs> mm. Yes. Great idea. Mm -hmm. And technically, so well done. You said you weren't good at it, but boy, I thought you did a great job. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Pretty seamless. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. Yeah. I did rehearse a lot. <laughs> well, it was wonderful. Yeah. 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 It was, it was good. Um, there was a question for Deb. It says, Your poem on birth, I think you said that was from your first book. Were you 14 years old when you wrote your first book? Was that from your 14 year old? <laughs> <laughs> no. <Duff. laughs> <laughs> Uh, it says you're a fabulous writer. I enjoyed hearing and seeing your work. Thanks. That's from Ivy Farinella. Oh, can you can you switch to me so I can show? There you go. Looks mm -hmm. good. Um, but I'm on the thing. I don't think. Hmm. I might. You need to switch to me. We can see you. No, it looks. Oh, well, good. The, well, other people can see. Mm hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 hi, yes. so, hi, hi, Ivy. This is the poem that, that 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 I mean. This is the book that that poem is from, and you can access it on the um, website. So no, not for, let's see. That was two thousand eight. So I was not fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> not even close. <laughs> Seventeen. <laughs> um, we have a comment from Sharon Smith saying. Um, a comment, not a question for Julia. He said is a stunning poem. I can still feel it in my heart. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing so thoroughly. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you, Sharon. Yes. Yes. Claire, uh, I don't see a lot of questions, but I do see a lot of comments. Um, Claire Walsh says, Nancy, what fun to listen to your poetry. Mm -hmm. I grew up in an Irish Catholic neighborhood <laughs> with the calling OMG and thoroughly enjoyed your beautiful work. I live with an Irish husband and I'm happy to say I am lucky enough. Aww. I saw a lot of, um, among the six poets here, I saw a lot of nodding to Nancy's poems. <laughs> to strike mm -hmm. uh, some common themes there. Um, John, I especially noticed you seem to be identifying with some of that. Oh, so much, especially when she talked about uh, uh, Irish people's relationship to paisans. I mean, <laughs> it's, yeah. a type, it's a type Thank God for them. Oh my goodness, you know. <laughs> I was the only Italian kid in an Irish neighborhood and 
proud to be there. Yeah, um, I've been married twice. Both of my wives have been 100% Irish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Carol is, uh, we did that my heritage thing and she's like 99%. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Love, we love our Irish. <laughs> John, you know the Irish cookbook is the shortest book in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Christine Beck says, Ben, my mother's novel is a terrific conceit. Well done. I love the way you read it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I also. Amazing. Amazing. I've got a question for John. Uh, what are you, what project are you on to? Well, I know one of your projects, but uh, after Pond, uh, I know you're writing. In a private book, but something you're it's, writing. I, and I use this term very loosely. It's a call and response um, book. And um, the call poem, it's, it's all in form. The call poem is a garland uh, and the response poem is a guzzle. And so they're, they're pairs of poems wow. uh, where the garland sort of presents uh, uh, an experience or a situation um, and then I, I, I try to respond to it in a guzzle. Yeah. Um, cool. About halfway finished. It's I love it. Yeah. Um. Hmm. We could talk to each other too, couldn't we? Uh, John, I, I'm just uh, that algae, oh. the poem with the algae in it, that just knocks me oh, out. Thank you. There was a, I can't remember the line, there was a line in there that was so spectacular. It, was a, uh, it referred to the, the kind of the fluorescent quality of the uh, algae. Uh, read it again, would you? Sure, yeah. yeah. I sure do, yeah, here it is. Um, a pallid algae embedded in ice like a flea trapped in amber offers a day glow dab to the rusted out brown landscape neon string algae luminous beside the hoarfrost and the dented surface of the pond, the moon rolled out and hammered. Well, yeah. Well. Oh. Oh. Which letter did you have the most difficulty finding? Three hundred and sixty-five. Oh, oh, O's. O's. O's gave me fits. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had um, I had a thesaurus and three different dictionaries uh, on the desk, and um, uh, yeah. and then I kept a spreadsheet of of words so that I so that I would be sure that I didn't repeat any because you know you use a word today and then two hundred days later <laughs> you kind of maybe forget that you used that word so I kept a spreadsheet and cross-checked everything and wow mm. became a bear i'll tell you yeah. <laughs> were you tempted to make up any words <laughs> no 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 i wasn't you know one day i went i was fu so funny i went to uh uh lunch with um uh with um uh, barbara um barbara greenbaum and um I hadn't used this word yet. And she said, I'll bet the first word you used was ornithology. And I was so thankful I hadn't used it yet. And she, yay, she gave me a word, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 
Ben, I was relating to your mother who was a nurse, you said, uh, yeah. right? And uh, the time she was uh, born a little bit before I was, but there was a time in life where for women, you had a choice of two things, either be a teacher or a nurse. Yeah. And, you know, if your mother was as erudite and scholarly as she sounded in your poem, uh, she must have been very frustrated. Uh, did she ever write any poetry about nursing or anything like that? No, she, she, she never wrote a thing, but that's, Nancy, that, that's exactly what, what I was thinking about, you know, that um, in, in, I, I have a feeling if our situations were reversed, I would have been a better nurse and she would have been a better writer. <laughs> if the opportunity had switched us, she, she really had a, um, just, just, just a remarkable mind and she could just, just, I mean, just, just chew through books and, and, you know, have a level of understanding that, um, you know, astounded me. Things I might have studied in grad school. She didn't need the courses. She just intuitively yeah. understood. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's just like it's just like you're saying that. I, I don't. You know, I maybe you know. I, I I struggle with it because there are obviously many women born in in the 40s and late 30s who 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 found their way past that binary, and yet at the same time, the binary must not have been easy at all to find your way past. You know, um, uh, mother, uh, spinster, uh, teacher, nurse. That's yeah, yeah. You know? um, but the what you had to study in nursing, you know, microbiology, chemistry. Oh, she has yeah. a mind that is reading the classics, and oh mm -hmm. man, uh, be sure you get her. You know, the frustration. I I really. Um, uh, identified with, you know. Well, that's, yeah, your, your poem about your mother, um, I, I, I was also very moved by. I mean, I, I'm, yeah, oh. I'm in a state to be affected by mother poems. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes. So we, uh, we have a couple of questions for John. Um, Luisa Saicedo Camora wants to know, uh, were you ever tempted to skip a day? And what did you do on busy days? No, I, you know, that's a, that's a great question. The, uh, <clears throat> it got to the point where um, I would say early on, and I would call early on the first hundred days, um, it never occurred to me to skip a day. Um, and then it got to a point where skipping a day was not a possibility because of the ramifications. I mean, if I had, if I had gone 200 days with, without missing a day and then just chose to miss a day, I would never, I would never be able to uh, reconcile that with myself. So, so uh, no, I never, I never thought of skipping a day. And on, and on busy days, um, I would either be down there at 4.30 or 5 in the morning or wait oh, until, <laughs> or wait until um, the end of the day and go down in the dark. Um, but no, uh, not, skipping a day was not possible. I couldn't, couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. And um, were you influenced by the documentary, The Octopus Teacher? No. Okay. Yep. But it's an incredible documentary. My, my octopus teacher is one of my favorite documentaries. Everybody must see it. I think it's going to win uh, many prizes for best documentary. I it's, keep going by it and, on Netflix. and keeping over it. When I'm, when I'm looking for something to watch, I keep skipping it, but I won't now. Oh, I, <laughs> it, I mean, it's an unlikely title, I know. It, it's an absolutely gorgeous, very moving movie, despite or a documentary really, yeah. I'm on it tomorrow, my brother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Julia, uh, Peggy Dietsche says, um, she asks, will there be another chat book or when might we see them in a new full volume? 
Well, yes, I'm still writing. So, you know, everybody who is on this panel writes poems and hopes one day they're going to find a home, you know, in a journal and ultimately in a collection. So, uh, yeah, there'll be more. There'll be more with any luck. Mm. I'm reading the, uh, the comments. Mm. Yeah. Julia, the, the poem he said, um, I guess that's my comment. <laughs> just, yeah. just, I well, know. You know, I mean, the topic is a difficult one, obviously, and there's so much that is really unsayable. There's so much, you know, pain and grief and tragedy um, that, you know, that is, that's inside, obviously, and the poetry is there to bring it out and to share that with other people, hopefully to touch them, to help them understand. Um, addiction is an, an epidemic in this country. Uh, we don't hear about it so much anymore because of the pandemic, but, um, you know, hundreds of people die a day from Mm -hmm. uh, addiction. And it's worse now because of the pandemic. And uh, it just affects everybody. I mean, everybody has to know someone. And um, it's just so important that we try to understand. Um, related to that, Debbie Gilbert has a question. What organizations could we who are touched by your poetry support? Uh, well, uh, CCAR, which has branches in Hartford and Manchester and other parts of the state, which is there to help people who are in recovery, uh, you know, gives them a meeting place and a place to look for jobs. Because I think that's the hardest thing for people that are struggling with staying sober, um, you know, it, it's getting employed again so that there's a sense of self worth and, and purpose and, and a schedule that they have to follow and all of that. But finding jobs once you've uh, been out of the workforce for a while or uh, been in jail, you know, and have convictions, it's really difficult. So CCAR is one I would say. Uh, another is uh, Today I Matter, which helps bring um, the issues of addiction uh, out in the public and, and sponsors a lot of different events. There's, there's, there are resources in Connecticut and thank mm -hmm. you for asking that question and I hope people support them. Mm -hmm. um, Loretta Torino says, Julia's words need to be heard and shared such bravery and bearing of her soul. Although not pretty at all times, the weaving of fairy tales and the familiar words added such a dramatic flair to such a heartfelt story. I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Well said. Oh. Well said. I won't mention that to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell her what to say though. <laughs> um. I'd like to add a, a, a just a PS to John's idea of you know uh, writing every day. Well, your the passion for it, the need to write every day during that series of poems. Uh, I think you write every day anyway. Is my guess. You go out to your fire pit mm -hmm. at least one poem a day. Uh, I'm trying to do the same thing. I think everybody should do that. It's it's wonderful whether you you you, uh, you start. Uh, looking at your big toe and uh, then uh, see where it takes you. And, and there's always something buried down underneath where the dreams lie that you didn't expect. And uh, the act of writing sometimes uh, uh, activates that subterranean uh, pool of uh, uh, inspiration. Have you always written daily, Rennie? I, I I have been ever since I uh, became a cancer victim. I've been writing every day. Uh, 
I, I think that was part of my uh, way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful uh, way through and out. It's a way of coming through, as, as the, mm -hmm. my, that title of my book suggests. I don't know how people survive without some art form, whether it be it music or dance or whatever mm -hmm. that they practice every day. What poet, Rennie, what poet did your mother like? <laughs> well, you know, it, Billy Collins uh, adopted her as his mother when his own mother died. Uh, and he wrote a beautiful blurb for her book. And when when she was in the audience at one of his readings, he would often stop in the middle of always and say, Eleanor, what would you like me to read? <laughs> Unfortunately, at one point she said, oh, Canada, which is perhaps one of his worst poems. But, but uh, <laughs> Billy Collins was one of her, was one of her favorite poets. Uh, and uh, Richard Wilbur was another. Rennie, cool. Rennie, Rennie, seeing you reminds reminded me of, of Charlie Darling. Too. Oh, oh, oh. You know, so I was thinking about him while you were reading. Dear Charlie, book. he was so wonderful. Yeah, yeah. He was the world's so, tallest poet. Yes, and <laughs> wonderful, I, I, wonderful I, man, I wonderful still, poet. Yes, I still miss him. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great compliment. Do you mind if I share? Do you mind if I share a quick one that I wrote about him? Fine with me. <laughs> about Charlie, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because he just he was so amazing. A lot of us knew him. It's called Darling Poet. Why yeah. Charlie? Why Charlie gone a year or is it twenty? Do I remember you now? Six feet eight and three quarter inch, Charles. Soaring spine folding into the confinement of your compact car like Jacob's ladder put away after playing. <laughs> size, size 16 hush puppies shuffling, shuffling through the halls of academe, gangly body housing ballerina spirit. Long strong fingers tapping on the black and IBM electric key like first drops of rain hitting leaves. Your words, your words, your beautiful words. Slump of shoulders betraying the weight of your secrets and humility's soft surrender. Shy smile revealing a boyish imp darting out from behind the caustic booming laugh of irony. Furrow of brow shoring up the chassis of your glasses. This heft and refractive power floating between the sad sweet infinite depths of your eyes and everything else. Belying the delicacy of your vision I didn't know, I didn't know. And when I did, I knew not what to do. Behind the sturdy shock of hair that swept across your forehead lay a voracious presence, an interloper, growing mutely with lethal force, insinuating into places where silken images arose and spiraled along nerve channels, exiting out your fingers to be spun into golden zones. Faceless intruder set up camp in the space where questions and yearning intersected. Stalking in, he stole you away. Mm. 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 Oh yeah. dear, I hope Elizabeth Kincaid Ehlers is out there. She she ran a workshop for many years. Of, yeah, uh, which right. uh, Charlie was uh, Charles, I should say, was one of the main uh, uh, parts. Right. right. Yeah. Deborah, well, I also loved your poem, uh, The Layers of the Brain. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm a big reader. You know, I read all the time. And so science, yeah. you know, I'm very drawn to science. It's so weird and interesting. Yeah. What what book is, is that in this book that it's, you just that's in the That's in the, th the new one, Third Eye on the Prize, yeah. OK. Couldn't take my eyes off that that diagram of the brain. Oh. <laughs> Having smashed my head practically open the other day. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm paging through this. I don't know that I have read every piece of praise. Uh, there are quite a few, but I think it is getting late. And um, with your poem, 
Deborah, I think that would be a good place for us to close unless anyone has any last words. Um, I would just let Pat, could I just show mine one, let's see, like this. Yeah, that's that, good. That is the only good photo I have ever taken in my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> I guess um, I, 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 and would, I, thank, I would thank, well, thanks to Grace and Books for publishing it. And I am just totally honored to be with all these wonderful poets tonight. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you to all of the rest of you guys. Really uh, enjoyed being with you. I think Ben has something. You know, likewise. No. I, I just wanted to say I, how, how awesome it is to see Ben. Hi, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> and and Julia, awesome to see you and Nancy, uh, everybody, Pat, um, um, Barbara, uh, my my bro R down there. <laughs> it just feels so good to see everybody. It's uh, we've been so isolated. Yeah, I know. I know. Zoom is wonderful. Of... Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank God for gallery view. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the isolation is beginning to get to me, and this has been awesome for me. Mm -hmm. Well, make sure you all tune in next month to hear our featured poet. And that will have an open mic, so you have an opportunity to read a poem at the open mic. And uh, we'll be able to see the audience uh, because it won't be in webinar form. So, you know, okay. we can see a whole lot more people next month. Oh yeah, and hey, to all you guys we cannot see. Thank you so much. For yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to our audience for coming to listen yeah. and supporting yeah, our no. poets. Must thanks be lots. to the poets for reading. Thank you. And um, on the, the uh, yeah, Q and A. Come next. Come next month, February 9th, seven p.m. Karen Schofield. Mm. All right. February 9th. Okay, put that yep. in my book. Got it. Okay, right. thanks. Good night, everybody. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Good night. And a good Bye. job. Love you guys.